on uh, science communication, uh, which will be um, moderated by Daniel Mietjen from uh, Wikimedia in Residence or Wikipedia in Residence at the Open Knowledge Foundation. And um, we will start with a short video clip. I'm sorry for the delay; it's all my fault uh, because uh, due to d technical uh, circumstances. Um, and then he will uh, introduce you to the other three panelists. Thank you. Okay. So um, the the video is just to get you all uh, kind of into the open science, open research mood. And then uh, the the session that we uh, have here is meant to discuss what opening up the research process actually means in terms of communicating science. Communicating science between scientists, but also between scientists and the wider world. Open research. Open research is the concept of scientists sharing their research with the world as soon as they record it for themselves. This is essential to make research more efficient than it is today. Research resembles a puzzle. A heap of pieces has to be assembled into a coherent picture. Yet some of the pieces are unknown, and traditional non-open science keeps much of the remainder hidden behind barriers erected by pre-digital reputation and reward systems. Open science means tackling research problems collaboratively by sharing research tools, data, materials, and code as they arise, and by building on the shared work. As Beethoven said, there should be only one repository of research in the world to which the artist would donate his works in order to take what he would need. Ideally, scientific research would be in the public domain by default, and Beethoven's repository would be federated rather than centralized. Okay, and in order to demonstrate the principle, this video is also in the public domain, but it has attribution, uh, and so this is just to show that the two things can go together. This session here is experimental in several senses, so our first speaker will actually come in via Twitter. That's why we have this Twitter wall here. Um, and, um, but before we, we call her, um, I will just uh, introduce the panel. So, um, the first one here, um, I always forget his name, fortunately we have <laughs> Joachim Storsberg from, from the Fraunhofer. Fraunhofer operates many institutes and so very often people are introduced as being from the Fraunhofer Institute, that's always wrong, um, because there are several. So he's from one Fraunhofer Institute and works on uh, implants for, for eyes and retina basically, but he's uh, also um, an expert in, in how to communicate science. Um, the next one is Lars Fischer from Spektrum der Wissenschaften, kind of the German edition of Scientific American. And uh, last one, uh, Cornelius Puschmann, uh, who is studying the uh, social aspects of how the web is being used by scientists. And uh, yeah, the, uh, the two of them are also on Twitter, uh, as I am. Um, and we have this Twitter wall here. Uh, over which you will now hopefully see Jenny coming in. Jenny Molloy is community manager at the Open Knowledge Foundation and is running the Open Science Work Group there. So I'll just call her to uh, start. Uh, I, I gave her a number of questions and asked her to give us a Twitterversity um, course on the topic of Open Science. So um, I just tweeted to her and uh, her uh, thoughts should now come in as a series of tweets uh, on the topic of open science and how it influences the way that we can communicate uh, science. So this will certainly have uh, some delays and there will be some th things that go wrong, but it's just an attempt to bring a bit more life into those panel discussions so that you don't all snore away after the lunch. Um, so um, watch out for tweets that come from Jenny Molloy. And uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, good if you can see such that you can uh, watch the Twitter wall without um, getting pain in, in your neck. Okay, and uh, as long as we're waiting for, for that, and I, I can um, go here to the 
uh, sessions plan because yeah, she will uh, take some time. Um, there, there is a, a thought experiment that I would like you to. Oh, she's starting. A, a thought experiment that you would, uh, I would like you to uh, keep in mind while we're doing this session. And one of these is uh, why don't we have um, spectators? Why is science not being broadcast live on TV? Or the other way around, uh, what uh, would happen if science were uh, practiced like a European championship in football is practiced? That everybody can watch all of those 90 or 120 minutes, everybody can see that the referee made a mistake or something like this, or that this and that uh, uh, guy on, on the field uh, is, is not in a good uh, day, uh, doesn't have a good day today. So um, these things are visible in sports, uh, and, but they are not really visible in science. We only publish paper about things that happened way in the past, and they don't report in, in such detail about the science as we would uh, report about uh, an ongoing football match. But now please have a look at the uh, tweets that Jenny is sending us. Um, I'll pick out some of them and uh, the idea is then that our uh, panelists will respond to those that they find interesting, remarkable, remarkable or wrong in some way. Uh, so open science means that scientific knowledge that anyone is free to reuse without restriction. Okay. Um, also means openness in the research process via collaboration, immediate public release of output. So uh, the thing is, if you do your stuff in the open, if you have your lab, research lab notebook, every scientist basically has a research lab notebook, um, if those notes would be public at the moment that you take your notes for yourself, this creates a whole lot of opportunity for interaction. Uh, because this means that someone else interested in your research could uh, regularly have a look at what you've done today or over the last week or over the last month. And then they could tell you, oh, I'm doing something similar to that. Uh, or I'm, I found a mistake here or I have a better suggestion for this and that. And uh, so uh, there, there is a whole lot of uh, potential for interaction. The interaction might be good for the people who are uh, participating. It might also be bad in some sense. And we hope uh, to be able to explore that. So uh, maybe you can start, uh, Cornelius, uh, with uh, providing some of your thoughts on, on the tweets that come in and uh, also on, on the topic in general. Right. Okay. Thanks. Um, thank you for coming here. Obviously, it's very hot. And obviously, oh, yeah. Sorry for that. Okay. Not sure. Just for the stream. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, um, Thank you very much for coming. It's obviously very hot. It's after lunch, so uh, we'll try our best to entertain you in a way that uh, prevents you from dozing off. Um, preparing for this, I, I asked myself what I could contribute because I've been to sort of different events recently about this broadly, this sort of subject of open science, and I wondered, you know, what I can bring to this, which is sort of new or which is at least not exactly like what uh, we've been talking about at these these other um, sort of events, and. Um, I decided using a question that I heard asked by a very senior sort of older professor um, at uh, an event about open digital scholarship a few years ago. And he said, um, paraphrasing, uh, is open science really better science? And that sounds sort of uh, silly or, or maybe provocative in many ways, but I think it's a good um, starting point, at least for me personally, in this discussion because um, I'll be using it um, to sort of get away from this. Uh, we make everything open and that's really good and we all like that and, and that's it. So, I find that to be a little um, not quite enough. So I'll, I'll be playing the devil's advocate, basically, in this, in this map. OK. Um, um, my background is, as some people have already know, um, in open access. I'm an open access activist. And so I asked myself, um, we know open access is good. And uh, open access is very popular with scientists and very popular with research organizations and that's a huge difference to open science. And my question would be why is that? Why where's the difference and how can we overcome the obstacles to 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 open science? Just you know, um, science and research is often driven by money. 
So um, it must be funded by somehow to to employ the people to research. So the groups are responsible to deliver results. So if you open it, it's a very good way because all people can judge and see the success. But imagine you would uh, divide the people in losers and winners. And so if you have a sport competition and you have a lot of spectators, you have the winners with the first third place and the others, they do not appear in, in, in a rank. So you have this competition. So I think you have, if you open the signs, you have to go to different directions that you have to distinguish what you open. So if you have science which is driven by public money, I agree fully, you have to make it public and you have to pay open it. In some cases you have to, to close it a little bit to a broad audience because if you have no competitors, you have no market and this is a, a point one has to think about. But if it's something value for the broad public, you should open the sources, it makes the science and research much, much more transparent and much more effective if the people, if the public sees the success or sees also the faults. The faults help other people to prevent to go in the same way. So you can actually you save money if you make the science open to, to the people which can follow up your results. So I think one has to establish a new system of funding to make it transparent. People getting public money have to open it to the public because they are paid by all these people for tax, everything. So everyone contributes to, to this research. And in this case, I think you have to open it. So it's to think about changing a little bit the current system of funding we have and to change the rules for applying of projects. So if you get public money, you have to involve all people to see your success or your mistakes. And so others can save even on time and money and it makes it for everyone more effective. So it's thinking about changing the system at all. Cool. Um, uh, I also wanted you to kind of react to the tweets uh, that Jenny is sending us, um, kind of missing that part, but she is addressing some of the, of the points that you are making. So for instance, uh, open science is not a cure-all. Having things out in the open does not make them useful or publicly understandable per se. Sure. So the question is then how can we combine this baseline of openness with things that make uh, things useful or understandable? Um, Maybe you can comment on that. And please try to keep an eye. I've, I've also now uh, uh, listed the tweets here. So I would try to keep an eye on what she's uh, giving us. I'm keep an eye on, on the people who are physically in the room. Everything else is too much for me. So okay. Keep an eye on, on all these things. Um, I, I would try, but I'm, I'm lousy at this. Um, I think you really raised some, some very important points for bringing in money and bringing in funding and uh, bringing in sort of the um, depth that uh, scholars have to the public. Because if they're publicly funded, then naturally, uh, they produce, the public have the right to what they produce. Um, I think uh, some, some points relating both to what we uh, um, tweeted and what you said. Um, first step, I guess, is distinguishing open science from open scholarship more broadly. Um, not all scholars are scientists and data, uh, for example, and, and the openness of the research uh, process is something that doesn't apply to all disciplines in the same way. So interdisciplinarity and different ideas of um, what constitutes scholarship, I think is quite important. Because for example, in the video, we saw this thing about science being a puzzle. You know, a lot of people in different fields will see that very differently and they won't see um, uh, themselves as being people contributing to little pieces of a puzzle, but they'll have different ideas of thinking about what it is that they do. So you know, that's this open, open research data is a different thing in philosophy or in uh, sociology or in uh, musicology or whatever than it is in, in chemistry or, or physics uh, or any other uh, discipline that, that measures, uh, that uses devices for measuring things, for example. Um, so that's, that's uh, one thing. But I think later on, I'd really like to get back to the point of, of funding um, and how uh, openness can be incentivized because I think that's, that's a really important point. Why I will uh, we have to uh, give scientists a reason to engage with the public. We have to give the public a reason to engage with the scientists. So, uh, in my opinion, it's, um, it's first and foremost a question not of tools and not, not of procedures. Or 
not not even about funding, but maybe but, but the first question is how do we make people uh, being open about science? Um, I personally believe that before we can get open science, we need open scientists. And uh, we we have to proceed stepwise and probably not with the actual science, with the actual research data because scientists are, are very very careful about their own ideas, very careful about their own data. So it's probably not a good idea to, to, to step in and ask them to disclose the most important stuff. I think we get that faster if we ask the scientists to be open person, to be open scientists, to be to be open citizens and then let them get in letting them getting used to the to the idea of being open and then they will in my opinion find it, find out that open science is a good idea for them. So uh, I, I wouldn't I would say that uh, we shouldn't go at it from a funding angle or from from uh, organization angle but but um, we have to change the mindset of the scientists, not only relating to science, uh, but relating to openness in general, in communication in general. Okay, Bef before you uh, again, I, I would like to introduce some more comments by Jenny. So, um, she says, if you'd like to open up your research, think about every frustration you've had with accessing, reproducing others' research. And I would like to uh, ask you here in the audience, how many of you have published some of your papers open access? Just raise your hand. Re really raise it. If, if any of your paper is available open access. That's a really low proportion for a community. You're assuming that everybody here is a scientist. Okay, let's first question. Have you published any paper? <laughs> okay. Uh, is any of these papers uh, open access? Okay. Next question, have you ever made data uh, public of yourself? Okay. Have you ever used publicly available data? Have you ever not been able to uh, access some paper that you would have liked to read? <laughs> <laughs> there are some people who are sleeping in the room here, obviously. <laughs> Okay, so that's, that's kind of the situation. So there's uh, still lots of people uh, who have problems accessing a literature, but even those don't always make their research available, not even by open access or open data. And then uh, what we're talking about here is open access and open data just as the start. We also want open lab notebooks. We want open grant proposals. We want open funding decisions in the long run. We don't want this all today, but we're talking about this uh, how to get there, what would be the usefulness of that, and uh, with this I'll give back to the panelists. I would like to respond to one of the streets. Uh, I'm not sure how research will change as a result of these interactions, but it will lead to different considerations. Uh, maybe all of you know this uh, cartoonist Modiglio, who makes drawings of these nice figures with big nose. And I can remember one cartoon, He's standing down and he's looking on the big tower, like in this uh, Rapunzel tale. You know, he's looking up, and there are two windows, and on the a top window, very high, there's looking a woman out of it. And he puts on a ladder and tries to climb up, and it's very long way. And on, on his way up, second, the second window opens and looks down and goes into this window. So um, he was very early at his goal, he didn't uh, go to have the long way. So if you make the things public and you, you see also the mistakes or something you said, you can, you can get the result uh, much earlier than this. Of course, it's a, it's a kind of secret thing, but some things you cannot publish. It's, if it leads to a misuse and people are doing research, which are very important for safety reasons or so, this you cannot do in any case public to everyone because the potential of misuse is, is unfortunately very high. So we have, we have to change our own world, which is impossible. But uh, to talk about this way to make it public, it, it's very, very important to to make it public and <coughs> the considerations that uh, results are published too early, uh, too early and make too, too much hope for them. This is, depends what you want to say with the data you get. So if you promise something already with this data you, you, you see, 
of course, that you can make the wrong holes through to all, and it's misleading information. But if you, if all people change their mind and be more honest about it, they publish and see it in a, in a way more, in a more neutral way, and people, people already very much emphasizes on which direction it goes, it makes, makes the thing more, more easy accessible to all and much more effective. Yeah, I'd like to respond, I think, to both of you and to Daniel as well. I think um, talking about funding and uh, starting there is exactly what we should be doing. I don't, don't think we should be talking uh, to the or about the individual researcher at all. Uh, why not? Because I think the converted, which are largely probably in the room, are converted. The rest doesn't care. I, I don't think the rest really cares. I think the rest will go wherever the funders, the policy makers, the universities, the big science institutions lead them. If they say be open, they will be open. If they say we don't care, they won't care. Um, they will not give up personal gain, uh, career benefits, uh, for a, a lofty collective goal of, of a better world. I'm not saying this because I want to be a nasty, uh, draw a nasty picture of, of scientists, but because I think we're trained very much in, in our respective disciplines to care about a certain kind of success and not really care about some larger goal. I mean, that's even effective. If you want to do somebody effectively in a discipline, you know, you can have them do lectures, endless lectures about the, the common good, but you can also just train them how to be a good chemist or a good biologist or a good literary critic or whatever, and they'll say, well, I'll publish wherever everybody else publishes. I mean, that's how not open access largely works. People go where everybody else is publishing, and that's good for their, their career, it gets them tenure, and there you go. So, you know, I think we've, we've collected all the people who, who, who are uh, enthusiastic, we'll get the rest by policy changes and by changes in the incentive system. I disagree. That's good. Because I know from, from my open access activity that I am uh, when it's true when you say that uh, most scientists care about the traditional way they career what they are looking at in the moment. But uh, my experience shows that you can, you have to change those you, you, you have to put those issues in the view of the scientists because many, many scientists really don't know about those issues and they never thought about it and what uh, when when you tell them do this do that, I will say okay. I have to do other things. I have to do it the way uh, it has been done before, the way it helps me. But uh, it is not a lack of will. It is, in my opinion, not not a lack of enthusiasm about the common good I mean, or new way. It's a lack of information. And I think that there is still work to be done. And it takes time for, for scientists to, to, to become conscious of, of, of those issues. Um, and I don't know if you are aware of, uh, of the movement that boycotts elsewhere at the moment. Um, Just raise your hands. How many of you have signed? Okay. Okay, uh, for, for everyone else, uh, in the scientific world currently uh, there is a boycott of a major scientific publisher going on, um, organized by scientists who are fed up with the practices of, of large scientific publishers. And really the problem, the problems have been around for decades, for years and years and years. But it took very long time for, for the critics to gain a critical mass uh, so that the boycotts, so that the movement could, could get off. And I think it's the same with open science. And there's very little information. If you ask some chemist in the lab or a molecular biologist or uh, uh, someone else, chances they will never. Ever have heard, even have heard about open science. 
and I think it's very important that we change that. <coughs> Yes, I want to continue with the point you mentioned. Um, uh, scientists are often yeah, evaluated by the number of, of publications and of the impact factor they get. So, and discussing this issue with the impact factor is something really artificial. For example, nature and, and, and science, they have the highest impact, very high impact factor. Other channels have a role. But this can change really very fast. If you look about Nobel Prizes and then they did their first publication in a completely unknown journal, the impact factor of the journal goes up like very high. And um, so you see it's not always the impact factor does not say anything about the quality of work. It depends on this panel behind. And what I, I've seen in the past is that this open access journals become even much, 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 much more and much and much more better because they are very transparent and a lot of people have access to them. To the, the other channels, you have to pay for this uh, to, get, to get them, to get the, the hard copy, or you, you get access via internet. You have to pay a lot of money if your institution does not have it. You have to get it somewhere else, and you pay a lot of money for it. And with this open access, it makes more transparent. So, from a view of, of uh, justice and the principle to be transparent and honest, the open access channel is very good, and I hope this will really, really change in the future much more to this open access channel and not to, to support this really high cost channels which, which establish some guys who earn a lot of money with this and that's nothing to do with science and then transparency and if the result is good or not. Okay, uh, this is a good moment where we can invite uh, feedback from the audience. I see some of you are tweeting already. Here we have uh, Deborah wants to say something. Should, we, uh, should she get a microphone as well? I don't know how this works for the live stream. You just come up here. Yeah, if you want to make a comment Please come here so that the people who, who are following the live stream can hear what you say. Um, hi, I think open access is great, but there's a problem. Um, I've been doing a lot of research in the uh, past few months discovering things that, I call, that are called junk journals. And there's now an awful lot of junk open access journals that run around saying, oh, we're open access journals. And anybody can publish anything in these journals. We're suddenly getting to the point where there's an enormous amount of, of open science out there that's not real science. And we've, we've got to find some way of sorting out a uh, kind of open peer review as well, so that in addition to the articles, we have the, the peer review information published right next to the article, critical or, or, or whatever, and not just have the stuff out there and, and, and have people uh, having high impact factors because there are some of these journals they insist you must quote at least two or three other uh, articles from their journal before you can get your thing published. So they're just gaming the impact factor and this is causing it quite a problem. And yes, it's exactly what you said. You have to be care about the, the peer review process. Yeah. I get every week an invitation to become an editor of a journal which I never had before and if I would be editor of this journal I would be, I don't know, I'm down to 200 editors I, I could be, but uh, uh, in a few I agree to do and I see what I get uh, from publications and what they take is to, to take internet services and write a, write a publication out of it to, to get it. But you know this often are people who write this publication you never heard before and if I take this shop ever every year, I'm very honest with a few sentences and, and mark it and say I found this on the internet and send it back and refuse it. So it's a way for, for the referees. They must be honest and, and judge it really. So this journal will not have a chance to establish because if you get no papers which are good, everyone will know it in the scientific community too. So, but this is a problem you have all the time. I know that a lot of, uh, of open access, they open, open, open access. But it's also published open access. It's also not possible without money. So you have to think about it. So they charge a fee often also to publish these papers. But uh, you can decide if they are good or, or not. You, you see it on the comments and who is writing this paper. OK, uh, we want to avoid long monologues. And uh, we also want to avoid getting into too detailed discussions, but a few comments nonetheless. So it is possible to publish open access uh, without uh, pu uh, publishing fees. Actually, most open access publishers do not charge fees. They're sponsored by a society or something. But the largest ones do charge. Uh, and and those, the largest ones produce most of the papers and so on. And also in terms of uh, having 
uh, the open access, lots of open access junk publishers, yes, this, uh, but this remain, uh, just reflects that we have lots of junk publishers in general, open access publish junk publishers are just a subset thereof. And if we would have the practice of always publishing the reviews along with any paper that is being published, this would uh, go a long way to sort out the, the wheat from the chaff. But especially the high-ranked journals, they don't publish uh, their reviews. Uh, some of the open access publishers do, so for instance Biomed Central is now publishing and has been doing so for years, is publishing the reviews of any paper that is published uh, in their journals along with the, uh, the papers. Uh, they are published at the end of, of the publishing process. In principle you could do this as the reviews happen. This is what Copernicus journals do. Copernicus uh, is a uh, geoscience uh, uh, publisher and what they do is you submit your manuscript it gets uploaded to the server where it is uh, visible to anyone and then the reviewers are invited they can uh, they provide their reviews just uh, as they would for any other journal they can choose whether they remain anonymous or not but the review will always be public along with the original manuscript then the authors have to respond to each of the individual reviews in public and then they have to revise their manuscript accordingly and, and so the whole peer review process is public and it is really easy for someone who understands the matter to really follow through um, how the arguments have shifted and how the, uh, the peer review has actually influenced the manuscript. Uh, whereas for most of the classical journals, we, you have no idea. You, you don't know uh, what the article looked like before it was submitted. You don't know how much of it was cut, which is an actual problem with nature and science, that people submit a real article that describes what they've actually done and then it is being cut to one third and all the necessary detail to really understand what's going on is cut out. And uh, also the reviews then refer to the original. Yeah, no monologues, okay. Yeah, yeah uh, we, we need more interaction. I get, uh, think you get, you get my point. We have here someone who wants to say something. Sorry. That's a really good point. Um, one issue I find really crucial and it's kind of um, covered by one of the tweets I'd like to read. Um, the issue is that those who do open science don't get rewards. It's good for science, but it's not for individual science. And it's, um, I think, uh, well, I can only speak for my own discipline, it's uh, psychology, and I think there are lots more, a lot more advan uh, um, advances to, uh, towards open science, like in physics and stuff like that. But I mean, for us, it's, there's exactly one journal that is widely accepted among scientists that is um, publishing open access. You can try to get in there, it's pretty cool, but you cannot publish all your stuff in there. Publishing, it's somewhere else in open access means that I do not get the credit I need to getting a professorship, for instance. That is exactly the crucial point. I'm totally into the idea. I'd love to have anything open, but if I do want to, uh, to do research all my, li uh, all my life, and I'd love to do that as well, I have to still, currently the system is that way, I just have to publish in journals that have a certain impact factor, because otherwise they, uh, I will never have any sort of chance to get a professorship and then um, keep on researching. And then, okay, you can say, yeah, but it's better for science uh, to have it open anyways. But then, okay, there are other researchers who did not publish open access who get the professorship and have the opportunity to do their research all their lives. So actually, I think it's the individual is important. Uh, I think it's still important to spread the idea because lots of people do not know about it. But still, I believe it's the system we all have to somehow change because otherwise it's just not manageable. Okay, about changing the system. We have had a similar situation uh, in several other aspects of society before. Let me just give this one example. Uh, Left-hand traffic, right-hand traffic. Several countries have switched, including Sweden. And there is a Wikipedia article about this dark and age when they have switched in 67, uh, where basically at some, somewhere five o'clock in the morning, uh, suddenly the rules changed and then you had to drive on the other hand side. And, and, and there was a break of 15 minutes imposed so that everybody gets it right. And we need something like, this is a political decision. Um, the, we need some, uh, some political decisions that help us uh, make this transition. Because this is, um, as I had um, opened before, it's a collective action problem. This is actually a set of problems that is known in sociology and already studied widely for a hundred years, but um, has not been implied, applied to the open science um, topic that much. 
And there are solutions that exist. Uh, we just have to think uh, in, in those terms. And so it can be done now. Sweden is driving on the other uh, hand side. They don't have any serious problems. They didn't have any major uh, rise in accidents around that time. Uh, it is uh, uh, possible to do if we find the right measures. And uh, I would like to get back to the role of funders that was mentioned. Is, really the, uh, is it really the funders that we have to go for or do we have to go for someone else, for the scientific societies or whatever, or should really um, make uh, every scientist make an effort, let's say, okay, uh, I do for every two research projects I do, I do one in the open, something like this. I think there might be more pushback in the scientific system uh, to put things up to change uh, more than the, the left driving, right driving uh, change, uh, perhaps. Um, how many tenured professors are here? Ah. And you publish open access? <laughs> yeah, okay. But I mean, that's, that's I think what, what you raised is, is precisely the point. There are some who might want to do something but can't if they don't want to risk um, uh, their careers. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm in totally agreement with that, and I don't have a solution, but I think the solution is more likely to reside with uh, lawmakers and funders, ultimately mostly inst uh, uh, institutions that can impose regulation on Sure, but then the question is, should uh, scientists act actively lobby those organizations or should they just carry on and wait for something to happen? And uh, we as scientists have the habit of basically ignoring policy and trying to concentrate on our research, but maybe that's not the optimal strategy here. I think we have to point to benefits which are more concrete than the fact that it will be a good thing for all somehow. I don't think that's precise <laughs> enough. Okay, we have here someone else. Can you please uh, come? So that the people who follow the live stream, they won't understand you if you don't speak into the microphone. I'm, I'm kind of um, surprised because my impression is that, is that this discussion here is a bit, bit, I mean, looking backwards. I mean, are we really talking about the reality that we have? What about, I mean, I'm, I'm not, not sure what you think open science is. Is open science only? Um, publishing in open access journals because what I see is actually that we see already a large, um, yeah, large practice of, of um, um, supplying science results. So people are using repositories to publish their papers. So there's SSRN for social sciences, there's um, Repack for economics, there's Archive for physics and information science, I think, as well. So that, that people, scientists are already um, making their stuff available. And even even scientists who have published um, or who are publishing papers in closed access journals increasingly are making these these papers available on their website. So that this is not an optimal solution. But I think the discussion so far is, is a bit backwards. It's, it's looking it's not really looking at what is what is what is already there and how can we how is, can we integrate that in open science and is this already open science and where are we? It looks like at least. It, it's a bit like um, we're the first one who came up with this idea and now we should start it. Um, the other thing is um, if open data, open science data is a part of it, um, I'm not sure, I mean, as a social scientist, how, how I should do this. Um, I mean, I have, I, I have a hard time understanding my data that is five years ago, and which I collected. And, and I mean, how, how should I be able, or how much work would it be for me to um, make this data available in a form that anyone could understand what it is and work with it. I'm not sure how, how I should do that. Okay, let me just uh, respond quickly to the uh, first question of what we are talking about here. Uh, so we're basically talking about opening up the whole research cycle. Uh, so here you have a depiction of the research cycle. This means research as a circular process starts somewhere on, on this road. Let's say you have an idea, you develop the idea, you uh, submit a, a proposal for funding. If you're lucky, you get the money, then you start planning your uh, data gathering, you gather the data, you analyze the data, and then you publish. In principle, the publishing step is a separate thing now, and it should not be a separate thing. You could publish at every of these individual steps, and that's not happening yet. So we see that people are putting some of their uh, published materials into the public and the, in the real public, but all the rest of the cycle is basically hidden. We are talking about making this open. And then in terms of uh, making your data available in, in a form that people can understand, if you make your data available 
in public at the same time that you make it available for you, then the others will see uh, the way in which the data have been gathered. And uh, so it will be more easy for them to follow. Uh, it, I agree that if you have not published your data yet, then uh, making it available for somebody else and gathering all the metadata is an uh, additional effort that uh, is maybe not doable. But if you do it for the world as you do it for yourself, then uh, this shouldn't be a, such a big problem. Uh, I would like to insert two thoughts at this point that came, that came up during the uh, question session. And the first is that what I was talking about here, open science. And well, if you say there is, there is so much that's already happening, I disagree because uh, open science doesn't just mean we, we make our data available, we, we make our procedures available, we make our papers available. Open science means dialogue between scientists and the public, an ongoing dialogue, not just, ju not just uh, resources being public. And we are, in my opinion, not at all there yet. That's the first thought. And no, the second thought is, we are talking about changing the system, but what is the system? The system essentially consists of all those scientists who are not just doing science, but uh, who are also sitting in funding agencies, who are in administration positions in universities, and so on, and so on, and so on, or scientists who are in uh, in political position, so um, in my opinion, that's not an abstract system that can be looked at uh, away from scientists, but, but uh, scientists are part of the system and make it up the system, so we won't get around changing scientists. Well, um, coming somehow from the science and technology studies background, I was wondering if I were a lab scientist, um, if publishing open access was really um, an option for me. Because we were talking about lab data and protocols and so on, and making it transparent what happens in the laboratory. And if you look back uh, at the summer, summer back in the history at the science wars, for example. So we had social scientists who went into the laboratories of the natural scientists and told the public what was happening there. And the result was a major uprise because um, the natural scientists, they felt misunderstood and they somehow felt that they were exposed as persons to a public who was judging them and to social scientists who were being unfair towards them. Because when you're working in a laboratory and in the conventional system, it's very much a system of safety. Because you can do um, mistakes in the laboratory to a certain extent. You can make errors as long as you get something out that's stable and that is correct. And you don't need to publish all the errors you made um, to show that you're maybe uh, somehow a bad researcher, but you do get good um, results. And if you um, publish your peer reviews, which may be unfair, very critical, I, I, I haven't gotten any, but I've read um, other people's peer reviews and I found them to be sometimes very unfair. And as a person, I wouldn't want to publish these peer reviews next to my text and make me as a person um, somehow, um, yeah, to be in the focus of attacks because of these um, peer reviews and all the data I publish to show my mistakes, but not only what I did right. And I think many people, and not only in the natural sciences, are reluctant because of um, these implications. Thank you. Um, I think you raised a really good point, and I'm also going to respond really quickly to the point before about us talking, sort of looking backwards, talking about open access and not talking sort of uh, more about open science proper. I think uh, what you raised is really important because um, total openness means sort of a constant surveillance, self-surveillance and surveillance by the public. 
Um, and uh, we can abstractly say that that's a really good thing, but I'm sure a lot of us can imagine situations where we wouldn't want to be uh, under, under, the, under public scrutiny all the time. Um, and especially because not even doing things wrong and then covering it up and so forth, but because um, we, we will feel misrepresented. I mean, what you said about data is a, is a really important point. If we are in disciplines which don't work with instruments that measure things and record things in a very, and even if we are, I mean, think about climate, uh, climatologists and so forth. But if you're, uh, for example, um, I was at a panel session on open data in linguistics once, and all the senior professors there were against open data sharing. They all said, I'm never going to do it. Others are going to take my data, use it for themselves, uh, plagiarize it, misrepresent it, and so forth. And uh, one area of um, uh, one data source in linguistics is going out doing field work in a remote part of the world um, and uh, documenting a language which is undocumented. Now, if you write a, a, a dictionary um, uh, for a language or a grammar for a language, that is a very subjective process uh, in the sense that, of course, there, there are methods that you use and so forth, but somebody else might come up with a completely, or at least in some areas, a very different interpretation of what's going on. So, you know, you not standing beside your data is when it's passed on to others and reused is something you don't want. You don't want it to go out there in the world and, and be reused in any conceivable way because people come back to you and say, what did you do there? This is all wrong. And we scientists, uh, I mean professional, and that, there again, that's an important point, um, uh, especially if science is your career, you, you don't want to um, uh, look, look uh, bad. You don't want to keep an index. I mean, we, we don't have web pages uh, saying, um, applied for a grant in 2005, declined, uh, handed in five papers in 2006, all declined. You know, we could make really long, funny biographies of ourselves with all the stuff that we didn't achieve, right? But we don't do that. And I agree things would be more transparent if we did, but it's just, I think that's really very much against human, human um, I don't know, maybe it's against human nature or maybe it's against uh, professional... It's just against practice, current practice. There, there are open scientists that write their grant proposals in public and if it's rejected then they publish the rejection notes at whatever they get. And uh, so it is doable. Uh, it's just a matter of, of culture and whether we want it. And it brings us back to the comment uh, by Lars that first we need some open scientists. Well, uh, now we have uh, some more comment uh, from there. I'd love to hear your stance on that. You have to stand up for open science here. <laughs> so, just to come back on the topic of funding agencies. So, in Canada, the biggest university takes the position that it owns the work. The result that if, if that in some cases, if you'd like a piece of data, you actually have to license it from the university, which essentially says you can't release it yourself, you have to get approval for any use you can you make of it and so on and so forth. In other words, I don't bother talking to anybody at the university because I can't work with them. At the same time, universities want the money from the funding agencies, and that's the only thing that, in my memory, has made the university back down on its uh, overhead charges on the research grants, because the public research agency says, no, you're not doing it. So if we want open access, it has to go, come through the public funding agency because they have the money and the universities want them. Just my tidbit. I think people can hear you, right? Yeah, but not on, not on the internet. 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 Yes, you do, right? Um, Coming from an Asian background on this, I think, at least for, from what I know, there, and I'm not sure how the panel will respond to this, but a lot, at least in Asia, or at least in developing countries, there tends to be, a, um, there's not a lot of incentive to participate in open science initiatives, largely because, you know, in my country, for example, scientists are generally well, uh, are generally underpaid, and so they don't see any incentive to participate in open science initiatives because they feel either, number one, there will be no support coming from funding agencies because there is no money. As it is, scientists in the Philippines, are gen um, their work is generally underfunded, which is why we have seen, at least in the last few years, 
an exodus of scientists to other countries just because they need to make more money than they are currently making right now. The second one is that there generally is no incentive because um, the culture, at least in, in my part of the world, probably is one where the working question generally, um, how do I say this? The working question generally is one that is not shared with the public because there is the perception that the public will not understand what, how the research, um, what the research is, first of all, and how is the research relevant. Um, and I think this is something that we have to consider here in that it's not just about making sure that this data is accessible, but it's also how we make this data relevant to those who want to make it accessible. So, uh, um, so uh, like, um, I wonder what the panel's thoughts are on this. Um, and who do you give the microphone to? Just leave it down. <coughs> All right. Well, I don't need that microphone, but I, I can just give briefly my ideas about this. And um, that would be um, open science uh, goes both ways. So um, the research in the Philippines could, for instance, participate in open science projects that are being run in other countries. By this, build a reputation, maybe invited to, to spend some time in, in a lab in Canada or somewhere. And, and then this might fa facilitate them getting a job or some more money from at home. So there's a whole lot of possibilities. The main problem here is we just have hypotheses about what would be simply because uh, open science has not really been tested versus the classical science or the classical way we do science. So coming back to the funders, what I would really like to see is a program where fu funders say, okay, here's a million that we devote to open access or open science, and we compare that to all those other millions that we've spent on research. And we'll see what is better in terms of whatever outcome they would like to uh, focus on. <coughs> Coming back to the statement where you said about the university, so uh, you are completely true. So, because it gets the money from public, it should also make it possible to the researchers to make it uh, to publish it in open access. There must be uh, something like a law, you know, where you change right left to left, right left to right, and they will give the money have to say, and you are right, this is okay, you are forced to do this, and you have to, to publish in open access so we can follow it. But it's not only about this open source and open access, it's not publication where you have a written form. It's also something you feel and you report about it. So if you see it, you can follow some results much, much better than if you read it in journals. I myself do not like to reach too much. I look over it and if I find something interesting, I stop. So I miss a lot of information just by reading it because I do not read it. But if I see something in a movie or on the television or something, some very interesting things. It's completely different. So we have a lot of projects which get a lot of money from public funders, millions and millions and millions for, for simple projects. But you hear in the public nothing about it. They develop uh, vaccines and do things in, in the medical fields which we will have really a high impact for the whole society, but you never hear about something. You hear only if there is a positive result, but we do not have the negative, and we do not know where the 500 million euros go. Uh, to the research, which you hear all, only about the five million which got success, but where are the others from? So it has to be changed ways that you report it also on, on the TV and the internet. You see a movie about the work, you go into the lab and make a movie so the TV can imagine what to do. Go to the hospital and you see what is, what is urgent, what kind of diseases do we have to fight against. So this is something for the public which they can also charge and say, okay, we want to have the funding. So also the crowd can participate in this whole process. I think we're in agreement, I mean, I don't know uh, how, how you feel, but I think um, there is a strong argument for things uh, could change very quickly in relation to open access, uh, and they have changed in some areas, in some fields, very rapidly in the last few years. I mean, I've been following this for a bunch of years now, and, and things are, are really accelerating, uh, definitely, in the, in the course of, of the last few years. Um, and they can change if this, you know, the funders or lawmakers or whoever make this, this uh, left of the road, right of the road uh, change in terms of, of, of changing the, the parameters, then you know, the behavior, I think, can change very quickly. Uh, so I wouldn't be pessimistic about that at all. Um, going on and, and going back to the comment about open science, open science being more, and us sort of not just talking about yesterday's issues uh, here, 
Um, I think one problem, and I don't want to be all about the problems, but one issue it raises for me, sharing data, um, using new publication formats, tweeting, blogging about research, um, having just a variety of, of new formats to communicate about science. Um, one issue I find is attribution. Maybe some of you know that there's several big initiatives, at least one really big initiative, to um, provide author ID um, uh, to make it possible to attribute all sorts of um, scholarly outputs to people so that you can have better metrics on who produced what. Um, and one issue I find with that is if everything, so I, you know, I stopped publishing in just in peer-reviewed journals because now, because there's author ID, I can publish in my blog, I can tweet, I can contribute to Wikipedia, and I get credit for all of that, hypothetically. So we're in that world now, where, where I get credit for all this because I can go to a funding agency or, or my university and say, look here, there's an electronic record tracing this all to me. All of these things are traceable back to me. Who reviews all of that stuff? And if we don't want it to be reviewed because it's inconceivable that somebody reviews my tweets or my little Wikipedia edit, then what makes it scientific? Because we don't have any way, I mean, right now, the one thing that all disciplines have in common that, that is sort of the pillar of, of institutional science is peer review. I mean, that's it. You know, no matter where you publish, there always has to be somebody else who says what you're doing is actual science. And if we broaden the scope of all these formats, which I think would be wonderful and which will happen, I think, but uh, who the hell reviews all of that? We already have too much on our plate when it comes to reviewing. Perhaps that's exactly the point why I'm skeptical about incentives. Because we want so much out of science. As you said, we want proper teaching, we want uh, Wikipedia, we want communication, and uh, we can't. We just can't legislate it. We 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 can. We can, in my opinion, change the system to to enforce this all. I think it. Uh, eventually, it's a matter of culture. Uh, scientists need to want this. Science has to, to be all. The science has, has to have that kind of culture if this is ever going to happen. So uh, it's not just a change of the system, it's a change of the culture that is needed if we want all that. And well, I don't, I don't know if it's possible, but we have to realize that uh, what we are talking about in, in, when we talk about open science is uh, not just just a change in the system, but a, a real sea change in culture. I don't know if it's possible. It's probably worth trying. Well, there might be in the audience here again. Um, just, just maybe a quick comment to that, um, to your point. Um, because actually, of course, it's not the same. It only tackles um, open access. But I mean, we have already there is already a compromise with those journals who publish open access, and they are peer reviewed and they have an impact factor and stuff like that. But there's just only a bunch of them. Um, and actually, I'm always wondering, um, because I mean, in the long run, it could be beneficial for the university just to pay the author the 1,500 bucks or whatever to, for, uh, for publishing that article open access instead of paying 20, 40,000 or whatever to, um, to get um, the, the journal like for the whole year. I'm not quite sure what the terms. Um, but of course, the, I think the critical point is well, how do we get that change, right? I mean, how do we get, um, how, how could one foster the change towards, for instance, more peer reviewed open access publications? Um, I do you know how we're doing this? Our Sorry? university is, is financing open access publications. It's not, I mean, that's already a practice. Uh, a, number of, yeah, a number of universities have uh, funds for publishing that's both. Golden, I mean, well, mostly Golden Road Open Access, so the university will pay the offer fees. I think we have a eight or nine or ten universities at least in Germany doing that now. So um, and the problem is it's done by libraries, and libraries tend to not be very good at publicizing this and communicating it to scientists. Also, because scientists never listen to librarians. Um, anything. Um, 
but I think, yeah, uh, if you look at the, the, um, the uh, uh, internet enquete commission, the, the commission uh, consulting the German uh, parliament right now, they, they have a recommendation that's like a month old or something of, on open access. They're supporting it um, and arguing it for it. Obviously, certain parties, political parties, are, are arguing for open access very strongly. It's also cheaper. I think the best argument always will, I mean, if you're trying to promote it, always say it increases impact because there is you can point in that direction, it does increase impact in some areas, and that's a tangible sort of benefit uh, rather than saying it's, it's a good thing. Um, but um, uh, going back to the, the um, or do you want to? I want to. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Let's stick it. No one wants to. So, I, I think what you raised, what the engineers just raised this uh, um, problem of really splitting work up in little pieces uh, and then trying to peer review that is a really good point. And this is also something that I think touches the motivation part. Um, because there, for me, there are two drivers of science for individual people. It's research. One is, is uh, curiosity, which would not be impaired by that, because you just want to find a solution. The other thing is reputation and a sense of achievement. So what happens when I publish everything, every little piece I do, and maybe do it together with other people, they contribute. What is actually my contribution? So. Because I think it's a really important driver for new things. Because people want to create something. Yeah, I don't. I'm not sure if, if, if you, in the end you, you yourself cannot even tell what you actually <coughs> did there. Because you yourself, not even the peer reviewers, but you yourself cannot even trace what is your contribution there. Uh, what you take, what is your in, your impact? I don't think that's that, that's really good for motivational purposes either. And um, yeah, so that would be another problem. And another thing I wanted to say um, to this cycle that we have, um, so I should publish all of the steps. Um, I, I cannot even, can you give an example what exactly I should publish? Should I publish my initial idea? Should I publish my initial data set? Should I publish every idea I have, even if it's stupid as, as hell? And, right. and it relates, when I compare it, for example, to a journalist writing an article, should he publish every idea that he has? Should we not also do this for book authors, for everyone that writes something? Why did it should only scientists do that? And, yeah, and I would have also really seen an example of a real life example of this sort of happening. Okay, I'll show you the life example. And uh, while I'm searching for it, I'll try to reply to the uh, question: Should I should I really um, um, yeah publish all all of the stuff and uh, the, and what is the difference between scientists and journalists? The main difference is that journalists are being paid for writing articles. Uh, for scientists, this is not exactly the, in the case. We're paid indirectly. The uh, articles that we write, they uh, contribute to why we get or keep a job, but they are not re we are not really paid per article, which is the case for journalists and all the other uh, people. So uh, this is uh, the main system. Also the, the whole issue of copyright and, and so on is, is, is different for people. If, if the only source of income for, for a journalist is the articles they write, then uh, they will stick to it. Uh, no, uh, for uh, the scientists also have teaching duties, they have administration duties, and in principle they could distribute uh, the, the science that they do via uh, things like archive. Where, where there is no uh, journal attached that doesn't have an impact factor, although you could certainly cr uh, calculate one if you want, and you could, in principle, calculate the same impact factor on Twitter or Wikipedia or whatever. And what I uh, want to show you uh, in terms of people uh, noting their um, ideas is a wiki that is used uh, for keeping lab, lab notebooks in the open. It's called Open Wetware. Like for wet, wetware is the stuff that biologists do in the, in the web, and here, uh, we can look at basically any page. I'll just uh, take one here. Biomicro Center pricing. So they, what they're doing, you can see here that they're uh, thinking about buying certain kinds of stuff, and that's uh, the, the conditions that they found. And um, one more example. Uh, this, this is happening live, so I, d I couldn't prepare that. And uh, uh, so here, genomic DNA preparation. So you see here how the, the protocol that they're using, and this is being made live. And uh, this is just the, the stuff that you would normally note in your notebooks, as stupid as it may be initially. Ma you need many ideas in order to have some good ideas, is something that someone said at some point. And uh, so it is worth to um, 
note all those ideas. And in order to get back to uh, the point of attribution, what does it mean if I have contributed to something like Wikipedia or so? But then uh, let me just reverse the question. Uh, what does it mean to have contributed to a, a genetics paper with 500 authors or so? Um, which, uh, which is also a, a standard. The number of authors per paper increases dramatically in, in some disciplines. It's really hundreds is normal, like theoretical uh, physics or particle physics and genetics. And, but there is a solution to that. Um, it, it technically, it exists um, uh, already on places that are very similar to Wikipedia. So here we have a wiki that is called Wikigenes, uh, which has uh, a number of entries. I just go on any of those. And if you click on any portion of the text, you see it has been written by this year. Banerjee Basu has written the, the things highlighted in red here. And if I click on uh, this, well, some other portion here. This was written by McDermott, KD, uh, and so on. So the tools exist, we just don't use them. And also, um, if you just take the, the example of Wikipedia, with, uh, which we're, with which we're all familiar, uh, wouldn't it be really cool if you could tell to uh, your professor or someone that you're applying for, uh, you know, I wrote that Wikipedia article on this particular protein, for instance, they can check. They can check whether you wrote it. You can, they can check what, what the quality of that article is. Isn't that uh, a way to really get attribution? <laughs> well, it, uh, you will have written two words or three words, 500 words. In the normal case, the lobby is you have to written the whole article. It's exactly what you said. You cannot trace this back. Yeah, you can trace it. Here, here they do it. one example. Technically, it's possible. That's an anecdote. I think, I think we're um, looking at very different uh, disciplinary require different solutions. I think it's a very exciting question. What about open science or science 2.0 or whatever will be very specific to a certain discipline or a certain field or even more, more granular than that and what will sort of be generally applicable. The, the thing with the 500 authors which also, for example, CERN, the people doing the interesting experiments with a large paper on collider, they have papers on a regular basis with 500 authors and more. Uh, but that, you know, that doesn't apply. I, I, know, I know disciplines and this is not just anything, but I, I know um, that in some areas you will be um, scrutinized if you have co-authors for papers at all. If, if you publish with other people, uh, that, that you'll be told, why do you publish with others? Can you publish by yourself? How exactly is it that you work? Why, why can't you do this by yourself? So that's a, that's a big uh, disciplinary gap, I think. We have 10 more minutes. Okay, I, I, would have, I would like to add, I would want uh, the insert a bit of common sense into this discussion when it comes to, to, to thinking about publishing. Of course, it's not about publishing everything indiscriminately. Uh, what, in, my, in my opinion, it, it's about, as I said, it's about a dialogue, it, it's about openness. And as in a real dialogue, you can't, you can't have a dialogue if you keep everything to yourself, of course. But uh, you can't have a dialogue as well if you, if you blast out everything that crosses your mind at that, at that moment. So if, if you want to, to have open science, if you want to be open about your science, uh, what you need to do is to think very hard about what can be disclosed, why can it be disclosed, what, what do I want to, to achieve with closing, and uh, what, uh, what do I get out of it. So uh, I, I, get a, a bit, I get the impression that many people still think that it's uh, publishing every mistake, every everything that went wrong, uh, something like that. Um, I disagree. It's about openness. It's not about unconditional openness. It's not about publishing everything without thinking about it. But it's quite the opposite. It's very much about thinking very hard what to publish and why and, and who shall be reached by that. And well, that's, in my opinion, the point of a dialogue, that is, that they're, they're to think about what, what is important to the other, and not 
what do I have and how, how do I blast it out? That's not, not the point. I think what we've heard is, is this true and uh, the problem is open access and this is, is that we have it already, it's already existing, but it's not well accepted, this is the problem. So if you are looking for uh, precision and colleagues from me in medicine which are applying for a professorship, they are really judged by number of publications and impact factors. So when I try to publish with them something, they say, oh, why don't we publish there? And they say, okay, we publish and everyone knows it. And they say, no, 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 no. It's nothing worse for me because if someone reads my, I want to have this professorship and he looks at it and says, it's nothing worse for happening because the impact is not high enough or, or not, uh, not high enough. And I think it's a problem about being accepted. And the community we have at the moment in positions to decide often are still in this old running system about uh, impact factors and all the same, but which really turned in the past because if you look at the number of publications which appear also in so-called highly uh, 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 journals and uh, it's only because people are often judged, is, uh, yeah, judged on the number of publications they have and not what is really behind. And if you make it accessible, everyone can see what is really behind because more people can see what is behind and so they can judge. Okay, uh, to that point, uh, Jenny actually just sent a tweet. Uh, she says the, uh, one of the classic examples of uh, the uh, advances of or the uh, opportunities for open science is the arsenic life debate. So at the end of 2010, there was a, a paper published in Science Express, which is kind of the preprint uh, version of science. It's just not openly accessible. Um, and uh, it contained um, certain claims that bacteria can incorporate arsenic in, instead of uh, I think it was phosphor in, into their DNA and still live on it. And uh, this was accompanied by a press conference by NASA. It was uh, well covered in basically any newspaper that, that is printed anywhere in the world. And then some bloggers uh, with knowledge in the area, they read the paper and started to blog about it, and started to, to try to repeat uh, the uh, experiments because it's an extraordinary claim that arsenic, which is well a, a poison as we all know, could actually be incorporated into the DNA. And uh, yeah, it turned out that uh, there were a lot of methodological flaws in that uh, paper, although it was uh, peer reviewed by the well-established journal science. And within a few days, uh, most of the, uh, well, many of those flaws have been identified by different bloggers. And uh, yeah, so within days, the whole uh, line of argument uh, was uh, kind of broken. But then the final paper came out uh, half a year later, in science still, and it, had, it, it was accompanied by roughly 10 papers that basically smashed it um, on the basis of what had been in the blogs half a year ago. Uh, so that's perhaps one example that is worth thinking about in terms of uh, what the advantages of doing things in the open are. And uh, we have basically two, three more minutes. Anyone uh, wanting to give a, a final uh, comment or so? No, you're all uh, tired. Then uh, I would like to make one more comment, and that is we haven't talked about uh, dynamic publication formats. So far, what we publish is just a static document. It's one of those articles that you can count and then uh, put, put the, that count into your application. But if we were to publish stuff in dynamic environments like Wikipedia, then we would have uh, no need for those 25,000 journals and we would not uh, be flooded by the f a flood of information that comes out in those journals because we would just basically just watch that uh, the pages in, in our areas and if something happens in those pages first the, the changes will be smaller it will not be 10 pages it will just be a small edit or a, a series of small edits and you don't have all the introduction part blah blah around it because this is already contained in that Wikipedia article and, and so I would just like to um, introduce that thought into, into your brains and maybe we can continue in the uh, uh, coffee break. And here uh, I would give, uh, like to give the final word to the panelists. I'll make it really, really short and, and sort of connecting to what you just said. Um, I think we need to think about a paradigm shift from um, a system that we currently have which is really strongly geared towards competition. I mean, that's all the talking about open access that we just heard about. It's really strongly geared towards um, competition, and we need to uh, switch to a system that's geared towards collaboration and that incentivizes collaboration. It, you can't have the, you know, do it because it's, it's a good thing if, if in the end you're being punished for it. 
and we already heard a lot about that. And then I think a lot of um, things will uh, change from there. I also think we haven't touched upon that at all, but I think that's the elephant in the room. Uh, do we really need a system of institutionalized science the way that we currently have it in the future? And if you look at Wikipedia, Wikipedia is very different, sure, sure. But if you look at that, doesn't it make you think that if that's something that institutionalized science can't achieve, then what the hell is it good for? I mean, yeah, you know, or, 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 I, I wouldn't say, I, I'd say a, a, a strongly transformed system of institutionalized science, but not what we have today that produces results which are the results that we're getting today, so. Well, yes, I agree, of course. Um, the system we have has worked for a very long time and, and uh, that worked under very, very different circumstances. And, well, the, science, the scientific system we have is, is quaking in all corners. At least in my field, in, in chemistry, the publication system is really close to college. And uh, I personally believe that uh, scientific thought and plagiarism um, uh, and so on in, in publication is very, very widespread. So uh, I think change will happen soon. It has to happen because the system at this point is unsustainable in, in very important respect. And that's why I think uh, that there is a very, very good argument to be made uh, for going out to the scientists to, to, to talk about the idea of open science, not only open access or open data, but open science and, and science communication and uh, science as a cultural contribution because we don't know what the system will be in 20 or 50 years, but we have it. We know that things will change and they will change in very, very different ways and in various ways and we have a way, we have a Okay, thanks. Please hand over. <laughs> so I do I agree to what the last said and I think the system will change because it's already collapsing if you look on the number of different problems of publication. If you do it something like an open source, it, it will be more transparent and will everyone will benefit to it. And I think it will change soon. Okay, let's stop here. The breakout sessions are waiting and uh, they're now coming in here. A round of applause. <laughs> 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 first of all, I would say some applause for the panel. <laughs>